Uh, Minister Jay Shankar, India has more of a um, multiple choice mindset. Is, w would that be would that be right? Um, from non-alignment to, I think you may have called it, or somebody else called it, all alignment. So you can pick and choose alliances, but you can also pick and choose topics. On Russia, for example, you still buy uh, Russian oil. Uh, is that is that okay with your? Uh, counterpart from the US, everything is, your, your relationship is fine, you can do whatever you want, whenever you want? Uh, <laughs> okay, first of all. Uh, I mean, you're sitting next to each other. No, no, so. first of all, uh, delighted uh, to be here. Uh, and I couldn't find a better set of people to be with on the stage. Uh, so thank you for whoever put us all together. Uh, your question, uh, do we have multiple options? Answer is yes. Uh, is that a problem? Why should it be a problem? If I'm smart enough to have multiple options, you should be admiring me. You know, you shouldn't be criticizing. <laughs> now, is, is that a problem for other people? I don't think so. I don't think so, certainly in this case uh, and in that case, because look, uh, we try to explain what are the different pulls and pressures which countries have. And uh, it's very hard to have a unidimensional relationship. Now, again, different countries and different relationships have different histories. If I were to look, say, between the US and Germany, uh, it is rooted, you know, there's an alliance uh, nature to it. Uh, there's a certain uh, history on which that relationship is grounded. In our case, it's very different. So uh, I don't want you to even inadvertently uh, give the impression that we are purely and you know, unsentimentally transactional. We are not. Uh, you know, we get along with people, we believe in things, we share things, we agree on some things, but uh, you know, there are times when, uh, you know, when you're located in different places, have different levels of development, uh, different uh, uh, experiences, all of that uh, gets into it. So life is complicated, life is differentiated. And I think it's very important today not to reduce the entire complexity of our world into very sweeping propositions. Yeah. I think that era is today behind us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I agree very much with what Tony said, which is uh, good partners provide choices. Smart partners take some of those choices. Uh, but sometimes there will be choices on which you say, well, you know, I think I'll pass up on that one. It's a very good point, um, which brings me to uh, the BRICS and the rise of middle powers, because that is one of, uh, of the shifts that we see today. Do, to what extent do you think that that is a challenge to the West? Or maybe that can be sort of the bridge, especially in a world where we will see continued competition between the US and China. And I'm gonna ask Minister Jai okay. Shankar first, and, but I'd love for both of you to come yeah, in as well. I, I thought maybe the BRICS one you wanted the US. I, after you, Jai, please. Uh, but uh, look, uh, I, again, I think it's important to go back to how it began. The BRICS started in an era where Western dominance was very strong. Uh, the premier gathering of the world was the G7. And you had a number of significant powers in the world uh, who felt that, well, they were not part of the G7, but uh, maybe they also uh, brought value to the table by sitting and discussing with others. So in a sense, uh, you had a collection of these countries, it was originally four, uh, South Africa joined later. Uh, and uh, uh, if, you know, if you look at it, it's a very interesting group because it's uh, geographically as disparate as it can be. Uh, yet it is bound by the fact that uh, these discussions we've had over uh, a decade and a half have been very useful for all of us. Now, like any product, you test it in the market at some point. We tested it last year and asked people, so how many of you want to join BRICS? And we got almost 30 countries who were willing to join BRICS. 
So clearly, if 30 countries saw value in it, there must be something good we've done. Uh, so I, I think it's important today uh, to make a distinction being, between being non-West and anti-West. Mm -hmm. I would certainly characterize India as a country uh, which is non-West, but which has an extremely strong relationship with Western countries getting better by the day. Not everybody else necessarily in that grouping might qualify for that description. Uh, but uh, the, the contribution the BRICS has made, you know, if one looks at the G7 and how it evolved into the G20, I think in a way those additional 13 members who came into its bigger grouping uh, five of them are BRICS members. The fact that there was another group which was meeting regularly and discussing and debating, I think certainly was an input into the expansion of the G70, uh, G7 into the G G20. So I think we did a service to the world. Yeah. Secretary Blinken? Uh, I'm tempted to say uh, what my friend said and, and, and leave it at that. Look, the, the, what we don't need to do and what we're not doing is trying to somehow design the world into rigid blocks. Uh, each and every one of the issues that we have to deal with and deal with in the interest of the American people may have different collections and coalitions of countries uh, that, are, that are focused on it, uh, that bring certain experiences, certain capacities. Um, and I think about it as, as variable geometry. We're putting together uh, a puzzle with collections of countries and, and not just countries, organizations of different sizes and different shapes to deal with a given problem. Uh, as Jai said, we have, uh, and of course, the fact that the relationship between our countries, I would argue, is uh, the strongest it's ever been, uh, makes no difference that uh, India happens to be a leading member of BRICS, uh, we're a leading member of the, the G7, we have the G20, and we have a multiplicity of things that we're doing together every single day in different uh, ways of organizing ourselves. Uh, India and the United States working together uh, in AUKUS, uh, working together, I mean, ex in, uh, excuse me, in the Quad, working together in uh, a variety of other uh, fora. Uh, all of this goes to the point that the, co the, the complexity and the multiplicity of the challenges we have demands that we find different ways to, to work together, and this shouldn't be done on an exclusive basis. Um, look, our default, of course, is to work in the first instance with uh, fellow democracies. That's only normal and natural, but we are not only willing, we are actively working with any country that wants to solve a particular problem and wants to do so uh, within the context of a, a rules-based order. That's the way we approach things. Speaking of a rule-based ba order, um, major powers today are criticized for sort of upholding the rule-based ba order and upholding values in certain uh, areas, but not um, in others, and a lot of people around the world, and particularly in the in the global south. But I would say not only in the global south, even within um, uh, our, our Western democracies, are confused. Um, they look at what's happening in Gaza and at the intensity of uh, the killing, and they ask, "Where are human rights?" What is, what is the, the view from, uh, from India? What would you, if, if you had uh, some advice for your colleagues, what would, you be t what would you tell them? Well, I don't have advice for my colleagues, though I particularly, I think all of us follow the enormous efforts which Tony is putting in right now. Uh, but uh, look, the way we look at it, uh, there are different dimensions, different elements to this. Number one, we must be clear that what happened on October 7th was terrorism. No caveats, no justification, no explanation. It was terrorism. Number two, uh, as Israel responds, it is important that Israel should be, should have been uh, very mindful of civilian casualties. Uh, that uh, it has an obligation to observe international humanitarian law. Uh, number three, uh, the return of hostages is today imperative. Uh, number four, there is a need for a humanitarian corridor, a sustainable humanitarian corridor to provide relief. And eventually, there has to be a, a permanent fix, a long-term fix, otherwise 
we're going to see a recurrence. And I think today, uh, suddenly India has long uh, believed in a two-state solution. We have uh, maintained that position for many decades. And I think today, many more countries in the world uh, today feel uh, not just that the two-state solution is necessary, but it is more urgent uh, than it was before.